everybody. Gorgeous day out. Took Blackjack for a quick little walk during my lunch break. And we're back with The Thief of Always, which I love very much. And when we last left off, you guys saw the read aloud with Miss Loria, social distancing, of course, in Red Gate Cafe. Hopefully later on this week, we're going to try to, whoa, technical difficulties. We're going to try to do that again because we had so much fun. I hope you enjoyed watching it. I told you guys that I have a new iPad, so I'm fiddling with it, trying to get used to it. All right. When we last left off, it was, um, the seasons had changed again. It was Christmas, and the Christmas bells were still ringing in some distant steeple, and their repetition lulled him into sleep. He dreamt that he was standing on the steps of his house, looking through the open door into its warm heart. Then the wind caught hold of him, turning him from the threshold and carrying him away into a deepless sleep. Okay, remember guys, you've got to be threading through this book. And I know it's hard because they're being ta I'm taping, recording this for you, but just go back and if you have to replay things, think about how uh, Harvey, what he liked and disliked in the beginning of the book and watch how the author is leading us through. Because remember, he didn't really like to sleep much, and he seems to be doing a lot of sleeping. All right, this is chapter eight. It's called Hungry Waters. I don't know if you guys can see the fish. Look at that. Remember what this is? That looks like the ark. And there's the fish. Take a good look. Okay. That first day in the holiday house, wow, with all its seasons and its spectacles, set the pattern for the many that were to follow. When Harvey woke the following morning, the sun once again pouring through a crack in, his, in the curtains, but this time lay in a warm pool on the pillow beside him. He sat up with a shout and a smile, and either one or the other, and sometimes both, remained on his lips for the rest of the day. There was plenty to do, work on the treehouse in the spring morning, followed by food and the laying of plans for the afternoon, games and lazy hours in the heat of summer, sometimes with Wendell and sometimes with Lulu, then adventures by the light of the harvest moon. And finally, when the winter wind had blown out the flame in the pumpkin heads and carpeted the grounds with snow. Chilly fun for them all out in the frosty air in a warm Christmas welcome when they were done. It was a day of holidays, the third as fine as the second and the fourth as fine as the third. And very soon Harvey began to forget that there was a dull world out beyond the wall, where the great beast February was still sleeping its tedious sleep. That's what I love about this author. He's showing you how time is going by. And time, you could tell, back thousands of years ago, that's how they used to tell time before there were clocks. So as the seasons passed, and remember, he's going through four seasons in one day. His only real reminder of the life he left, besides a second telephone call he had made to his mom and dad, and just to tell them all was well, was the present he wished for and received that first Christmas, his ark. He'd several times thought of trying it out on the lake to see if it would float, but it wasn't until the afternoon of the seventh day that he got around to doing so. The author's telling you he's been there seven days. 
if you go through four seasons in a year, think about that one. Wendell had made a real glutton of himself at lunch and had declared that it was too far too, and too hot to play. So Harvey wandered down to the lake on his own with the ark tucked under his arm. He half expected, hoped in fact, to find Lulu down there to keep him company, but the banks of the lake were empty. Once he laid eyes on the gloomy waters, he almost gave up the idea of launching but that meant admitting something to himself that he didn't wish to admit. So he headed on down to the shore, found a rock to perch on that looked less precarious than the others. Look up the word precarious if you're not sure. And set his ark on the water. It floated well, he was pleased to see. He pushed it to and fro for a little while then lifted it out and peered inside to see if it was leaking. It was quite watertight. However, so he set it back on the lake and pushed it out again. As he did so, he caught sight of the fish rising from the bottom of the lake, its mouth wide open, as if it intended to swallow his little vessel whole. He reached out to snatch the ark from the water, before it was either sunk or devoured. But in his haste, he lost his footing on the slimy, slick, slick rock. And with a cry, he fell into the lake. <laughs> the water was icy cold and eager. It's an interesting word to describe the water, eager. It quickly closed over his head. He flailed wildly, trying not to imagine the dark depths beneath him or the vast maw of the fish that had been rising from those depths. Turning his face up towards the surface, he started to swim. He could see that his arc floating above him, capsized by his, by his fall. Its lead passengers were already sinking. Animals. He didn't try to save them, but surfaced gasping for breath and paddled towards the shore. It wasn't much of a distance. In less than a minute, he was hauling himself up onto the rocks and scrambling away from the bank, water pouring from his sleeves and trousers and shoes. Only when his feet were well clear of the lake and no hungry fish could snap at his toes, did he drop down on the ground. Though it was midsummer and the sun was blazing somewhere overhead, the air around the lake was cold and he soon began to shiver. Before he made his way out into the sun, however, he looked for some sign of his ark. The spot where it had sunk was marked by a forlorn flotilla of wreckage. That means the ark was just broken up all of which would soon join the rest of the ark at the bottom. Of the fish that had seemed so eager to devour him, there was no sign. Perhaps it had swum down into the depths to chew on the downed menagerie. Ship. Or the, the menagerie really is like the ship and all the animal pieces. If so, Harvey hoped it choked on its dinner. He'd lost plenty of toys before. He'd had a brand new bicycle, his prized possession, stolen from the step of his house two birthdays ago. But this loss upset him as much, upset him more than others. The idea that the lake now had something that he had owned was somehow worse than a thief running off with his bike. A thief was warm flesh and blood. The lake was not. His possessions had gone into a nightmare place full of monstrous things, and he felt as though a little part of himself had gone with it, down into the dark. He walked away from the lake without looking back, but the breeze that came to warm his face 
when he broke through the thicket and the sound of birds that pleased his ear could not keep from his mind the thought he tried to ignore when he had gone down to the water. Despite all the entertainments that the Holiday House supplied so eagerly, it was a haunted place. And however hard he had tried to ignore his doubts and suppress his questions, they could not, they could be, could not be ignored. Whoever or whatever that haunter was, Harvey could not be content now until he had seen its face and knew its nature. All right, in your lesson today, you guys were supposed to uh, try to figure out how the character has more than one problem, more than one plot line. Think about this, he's had quite a few problems, Harvey hated school, was bored, wanted to take a vacation, wanted to be somewhere warm. So now he's come to the house, gets everything he wants. But he realizes something big that this house, even though there are so many nice things about it, there's something evil about this house and whoever owns it, Mr. Hood. And he's not going to rest now until he finds out what it is. Dun, dun, dun.